Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Million Pound Mission Podcast. It's your buddy, Adam, the PhD, the previously heavy dude. And this, my friends, is episode 300. Yay! Uh, We've got Dr. Jamie Seaman. We're talking about being fit, fabulous, and carnivore. This is a great episode. I told her, I said, yo, episode 300, you got to bring it, Doc. And she brought it for sure. Um, let's just talk me and you guys real quick before we dive into the episode, 300 episodes. I mean, 300 episodes ago, I launched this show with just, I had something burning inside of me. I had these experiences about my own journey and the people that I helped in my hometown. And I thought, you know, I might be able to help some more people out there. I might be able to put something in their earbuds that makes a difference. And I just want to say, thank you. This has been a dream of mine to be able to communicate with people like you that is listening right now. This message is meant for you. And I'm just so grateful to be able to show up on a regular basis and just talk about things that I feel like are important and get out there and know that it's making a difference. So shout out to you guys. You're an amazing audience. And I appreciate all the support that you throw my direction over these first 300 episodes, and here's to the next 300 episodes, and uh, I'm just so excited to connect with you and interact and keep bringing amazing guests on like Dr. Jamie and just further our combined quest to improve our health. Um, real quick, also before we dive into this episode, is this episode is, uh, is sponsored by our Meat and Bricks Challenge. I have uh, combined forces we kind of are started calling ourselves like the the low carb avengers it's it's a, a conglomerate it's a it's a super group it's a boy band if you will of low carb warriors and we're doing this challenge together myself keto savage robert sykes and danny vega and we are putting on a challenge uh, that's going to start uh, the first week of the new year january 6th and run for 28 days we're calling it the meat and bricks challenge it's based around consuming uh, daily just meat and keto bricks and we're going to have a ton of coaching and support and uh, just being able to dive in with you guys Uh, there's an online course component if you're looking for something to launch 2020 in the right direction or if you're looking to just get a little bit of a a level up with your community and with your coaching and I got to tell you like Danny and Robert their audience is giant and being able to access them in the way that you're going to be able to access them in a small group format like we will with this challenge is unique, all right? And their audience is only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, I'm really, really excited to really, if you guys don't know these guys like I do, you're going to get to know them a whole lot better. And they are awesome. They're awesome coaches. And we're all really excited about this challenge. So uh, you can get all that info at meatandbricks.com. Meatandbricks.com. Check it out. This is the last week to register, all right? Uh, if we have spots left at the time uh, that I'm recording this, we do have spots left, uh, but just check it out, meatandbricks.com. And if it goes over well, we'll do it again. So let me know what you think. Okay. Episode 300 y'all let's dive in. Uh, the question of this episode is, do you ever just get totally confused when you hear conflicting information about things like the ketogenic diet or the carnivore diet? So it seems like one minute, you're hearing all the experts talk about how these are the ultimate nutrition style that's going to optimize your health and save your life. And the next minute, the, there are other people saying that you will die if you eat this way. Your heart will explode. Your, your, your arteries will just blow up from eating this way. So to cut through all the clutter and confusion, I'm bringing in Dr. Fit and Fabulous herself to help us gain some clarity around a low-carb lifestyle choice from a medical perspective. And a lot of times you bring on doctors and people from the medical medical community and they are very dry. They're very, let's just say it, boring. Uh, Dr. Fit and Fab is not that. She is highly entertaining and she's just an awesome, awesome person. So Dr. Jamie Seaman is a board certified uh, obstetrician and gynecologist with a background in nutrition exercise, and health science. She is also a current fellow in integrative medicine and a board-certified ketogenic nutrition specialist. She's a wife. She's a mom to three little girls, and her goal is to help you with your human optimization and to help you get fit and fabulous like herself. Uh, So in this really, really deep dive, interesting conversation, we talk about the state of female fitness right now and how she sees this evolving in the next few years. 
we discuss what adjustments women should make if they're going to make a transition into a keto or carnivore or lower carb lifestyle. Uh, we talk about her recent experiment with a vegan nutrition protocol. She went vegan and did blood testing and just did some really interesting things to provide some feedback uh, for people that kind of are in that vegan versus low carb debate. Uh, we got her advice uh, for medical professionals that want to stay up to speed on current info around low carb lifestyle choices. That's super handy uh, because, you know, uh, to put it bluntly, a lot of the medical community is falling behind and they fall in that category of just not understanding the ketogenic diet or a low carb lifestyle. And then at the end, we finish up with a simple action step for parents that need to start investing more time in themselves. As I always say, a healthy mom, a healthy dad, that is good. That's an investment in the health of the family. And we talk about that. Uh, so great interview. You're going to love this. Uh, you're going to love Dr. Fit and Fab. And uh, let's just dive in. Episode 300, Being Fit, Fabulous, and a Carnivore Doctor with Dr. Jamie Seaman. All right, Dr. Fit and Fabulous, Jamie Seaman. Welcome to the Million Pound Mission Podcast. How are we doing today, my friend? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Adam. Well, this, as I told you, is episode 300. It's a big deal. And I, I wanted you for this episode because you are the most requested person by far in recent history. I mean, I'm getting DMs out of the woodwork. Like, have you seen Dr. Fit and Fabulous on Instagram? Have you seen what she's doing? These amazing self-experiments. And so I reached out and thankfully you said yes. And, and here we are for episode 300. So you ready to rock? I'm honored. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Now, I don't usually like to start things off on kind of a sad or, or, or dark note, but I feel like we need to talk about ne Nebraska Cornhusker football because we're both Midwesterners. You're, you're a diehard fan. How are you, how are you feeling about the season? <laughs> well, okay. I'm diehard, which means that I stick through thick and thin. Um, I'm a born and raised Cornhusker. My dad played for Nebraska, 77 nice. 7071 national championship. Yep. He's got a ring. I played for the Cornhuskers. I played collegiate softball there. So I'm not going anywhere. It's going to be fine. We just need to be patient. These are not even coach Frost's kids. It's going to be fine. People just, I get it. It's been a long time <laughs> since we've been good. Um, we just have to be patient. We have to yeah. be patient. It's going to be fine. we got a big game this week. So you got to beat the Hawkeyes this week, right? We have to beat the Iowa Hawkeyes, which Omaha, Nebraska, and Iowa Hawkeye territory overlap. So yeah. even like in my own office, I have tons of friends and family that are Iowa Hawkeye fans. So this is a big game. This is a huge rivalry. And really it comes down to us being bowl eligible if we win. So <laughs> it's a big <laughs> we have deal a lot on the line. Yeah. And the weather looks horrible. So I'll, I'll, I'll sit out there for the Huskers out there for the Huskers. Yeah. I, I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, home of Indiana university. And we won our first ever road game in like a decade at Nebraska. Like nobody ever thought it would happen and it happened this year and we're already bowl eligible and we don't know what to do with ourselves. So, uh, it, it's Congrats. Congrats. <laughs> like, wait, uh, when I went to school at IU, the football team had t-shirts were on the back. It was like, where, we, where do you want to go bowling this year? And it was like, you know, Pasadena It had this checklist, like Tampa. And the last one was the union, which is like the student <laughs> union. And we're all like, that's the one we're going to be checking again this year, bowling at the union, but uh, we're not bowling at the union this year. So that's, that's pretty exciting. But. Well, a really fun fact about Nebraska is we have the most winningest bowling team in the entire country. I don't even know what it is. That's like bajillion years in a row, national championship bowling team. That's, that's amazing. That yeah. is amazing. And we're not I, a football I, school. We're a bowling school. We're a bowling school. <laughs> yeah. We're a, we're a business school at Indiana University. We used to be a basketball school, but but I, I digress. Now, um, I want to dive into your story a little bit because you are a, a doctor. I want, I want to get into that whole story, but when did you realize that your impact and that reach that you have was bigger than the patients that you were, you were seeing in your clinic? Uh, when did you realize like, oh, this is, this is a little bit bigger. I've got a little bit of Instagram follow. I'm becoming an online influencer. What was that journey like? Well, you know, I kind of came into this space by mistake. I, it really started on a totally personal level for me, just figuring out my own health problems. And then that kind of spilled over into my clinical practice. And, you know, I had this small social media following at the time. I actually started on Facebook and then kind of moved over to Instagram only about a year ago. And uh, last summer I went down to KetoCon and I mean, I knew I was doing, you know, good things in my community and things like that, but 
I had all these people coming up from like other countries saying hi and oh my gosh, I love what you're doing. And it was kind of like in that moment where I realized, oh my gosh, like I'm really touching a lot of people, like people I don't even know. And now the messages just like flood in on a daily basis. And, you know, people that have never even reached out, I've been following you for a year and I've lost a hundred pounds and just these like incredible, incredible stories. And it really makes it so easy to do my job and do what I do because on a daily basis, I come to clinic and I see people having success and then people are flooding my direct messages with these amazing stories. And like, how can you not enjoy doing this? I mean, you're literally giving people the opportunity to live a better life. It's just, it's so rewarding. I don't even, I don't even know how to pay these people back for what they, you know, what they give to me too. Well, I, I can just feel the momentum. Like I said, I had so many people DM me and like, get her on the show. Like you are, you've been demanded. Uh, and I knew about you since KetoCon. I was down there as well. So I heard the, the, the momentum and the rumblings kind of coming out of that. And I, I dug into some of your interviews and you are just, you can tell you're being honest and authentic. Like you're not out there trying to sell your, your magical you know, carnivore program that, that solves you know, all the women's health issues and things like that. You're just like, here's what I'm doing, here's why I'm doing it, and here's how you can benefit from it too. And like your recent experiment that you did that I was just totally into, uh, where you did blood work and did you know, your self-experiment with going vegan versus being carnivore, um, that was pretty, pretty damn amazing. So can you dive into that a little bit and how, what led to that little experiment that you did? Well, I have, this whole thing for me has been all self-experimentation, you know? I really preach to people to be your own expert because I don't think that there's one lifestyle for everybody. Um, now, I come from a history of insulin resistance. I had pre-diabetes, so serial, you know, cutting out carbs from my life has had lots of health benefits for me. But there are people that have you know, better insulin sensitivity than me. And then we have this whole debate of like animal foods and plant foods. And you know, there's been so many extremes and I think it's, it's almost comical sometimes to just watch social media and like the vegans and the carnivores, like no. <laughs> going at it MMA no. style. But, you know, for me at the end of the day, it's what foods can I eat that give me optimal biomarkers and, and I feel great. Right. And I'm without disease. I'm in good health. Okay. So for me, I have settled on a mostly, mostly carnivore based lifestyle. I mean, I don't, I'm not a true carnivore. I mean, I do eat some plants. I have some avocados. I have nuts from time to time. And, and I have a good gut. I don't have autoimmune problems. I can tolerate plants just fine. And for me, it's really mostly, you know, like a texture thing. Like if I want to have a salad, I'm going to have a salad. Now I feel best. I mean, if I, you know, when I do my glucose monitoring, I feel best eating mostly carnivore. I'll be real honest. Um, but, you know, this idea of like, can you get health on a vegan diet? Well, my real issue is I want people to be able to eat a whole food diet where they get all the nutrients that they need. And I take care of people of reproductive age. So it's a big deal when you're talking about growing another human life in your belly. And so I have a problem with a diet that is, that is strictly plant-based without animal foods because it can be deficient in B12 and DHA and, yeah. and uh, you know, lots of important things for growing a baby. Now the whole experiment, I mean, people heard there was a documentary on Netflix. <laughs> We won't say what it was. You all know what it was. But, you know, they did this experiment where they took these people and these NFL football players and they gave them, uh, you know, bean burrito, chicken burrito, beef burrito, and they drew their serum. Well, first of all, this test is just silly, first of all. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's a qualitative assessment, right? So if you really want to know what the postprandial lipids look like, the fat in the blood after you eat, then send the blood to the lab and let's look at it. You know, there's lots of studies on postprandial lipids, but you know, my, my real issue with it is we know that if you eat fat and carbs together, the fat is going to hang around longer. So they gave this person a, a fatty meat burrito, right? But it had carbs. It had a tortilla and, and rice and whatnot versus a vegan burrito that was actually low in fat. A lot of people want to argue they had equivalent fat, but I just don't believe that. I just, I just don't believe it. So I thought, you know, I'm going to do my own experiment. I'm going to do the same experiment. I'm going to eat a vegan burrito, but I'm going to equal the amount of fat in it. And so I added enough avocado and coconut oil to equal 35 grams of fat. And, and then I ate eggs and bacon, which was 35 grams of fat, but I had to eat it without the carbs. So I couldn't make it a burrito. 
So I, I did the bacon and eggs first. I actually did it two days in a row and got two separate specimens um, because I didn't get good video footage <laughs> the first day because we're using it for um, the Food Lies upcoming uh, mini documentary that's gets getting released on December 5th. And so, um, and then the second day I did a fasted specimen so we could get fasted serum to see what that looked like just so we could have them all side by side to compare. And so I had a fasted specimen, this vegan specimen and the, and the, bacon and eggs. And um, I don't know when this podcast is getting released, but I'm sure people will see the doc at, at some point. But basically the vegan specimen was the cloudiest. It When you consume fat and carbs together, the, the fat hangs around longer. And so I think one of the biggest pitfalls of people who want to throw around nutritional research is they throw around a lot of nutritional research that's based on standard American diet and not in somebody that's in a state of ketosis or ketogenic. And so we can't take the nutrition research that involves fat and carbs together and say that that applies to people that don't consume that amount of carbs. They're just different physiologies, right? We know that ketones act as cellular signaling mechanisms. They do so much more inside the body than people really realize. And so my whole point of the experiment, I mean, I got accused of being like paid by big keto and I don't even know who big keto is, but I'm still waiting for my paycheck. <laughs> I think it's but Jimmy Moore. I think it's Jimmy Moore's big keto. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know who that is, but I mean, I'm just literally a vagina doctor in Omaha, Nebraska, doing my own end of one experiment. I'm not being paid by anyone. Um, I, I'm just doing this because, you know, we always need to question things. As scientists, that's what we do. We question things. We do our own experimentation. And people want to knock anecdotal evidence. But, you know, until low-carbon ketogenic research is completed, which for a lot of a lot of studies, it takes almost 17 years for that to translate into clinical practice. And so I don't have 17 years. I mean, I'm seeing patients this afternoon. I mean, they're right yeah. in front of me. They have real world problems. And I say this all the time. I'm not an Instagram doctor. I'm like a boots <laughs> on the ground physician. I'm in a clinic. I'm seeing patients. I mean, these are real people with real problems. So for me, it's just showing people because they do, they come into my clinic and they say, well, I saw this documentary and now I think I should go plant-based and they're confused. They're so confused. And so for me, it's really, you know, I'm just as, as human as my patients. And so I'm like, listen, I'm a busy mom. I'm a doctor. This is how I eat. This is how I have found good health. And I do coaching. I, you know, I, I individualize things for my patients. It's not, it's not a cookie cutter program or anything like that. Um, but it's really about being your own expert and, and don't just believe everything you see on Netflix, seriously. So one question I have is, can you explain... The, the whole cloudiness of the, the vials, you know, why is that of concern? Like, why should we even worry about this? Right. Okay. So basically there are studies that show <clears throat> that postprandial lipids, basically after you eat, when you ingest fat, right? When you ingest fat, it gets digested, it gets absorbed, it goes out in your bloodstream, right? And then your body has to do something with it. It either uses it for energy or it stores it. Exact same thing with glucose, right? But we can't see glucose in the serum. So when you draw whole blood, so I had a needle inserted into my vein, they drew my blood, it's in a test tube, they let that blood clot, and then they put it in something called a centrifuge, and it basically spins around like a merry-go-round really, really, really fast. And what it does is it pushes all the red blood cells, the erythrocytes, down to the bottom of the test tube, and then in the middle of the test tube, there's a white layer, and that white layer is white blood cells and platelets, and then on the top of the layer, you see this straw-colored fluid. That's the serum. That's the plasma. And if you have fats or lipids hanging out in your bloodstream, they hang out in that straw-colored fluid. And so the idea with this whole thing was basically that if it's clear, if you can see straight through it, that there's not that many lipids or there's no lipids hanging out in that serum. And if it's really cloudy, that means there's tons of, tons of lipids. So the experiment was done two hours after ingestion, which is about two to three hours was when the lipids will peak in the blood. So that's why they, that's why we chose that time to take a look at it. But, you know, they're making the correlation that if it's cloudy, that's bad. There are studies that show, you know, your post perandial, which means after you eat, after you eat, your lipid response is correlated with risk of cardiovascular disease. Because if those lipids are just hanging out in your bloodstream and they're not being used for energy, they're more likely to get glycated or oxidized and to go, you know, cause issues like atherosclerosis. But in a state of, you know, ketosis, where you don't have high blood sugar at the same time, your body can use that fat preferentially as a fuel source. And my point with the whole thing was, 
I'm a well-adapted fat burner. I've yeah. been ketogenic for like three years. My body is really good at utilizing lipids. And at two hours, my serum was practically clear. I mean, it almost looks as clear as the fasted specimen. So those lipids are not hanging out in my bloodstream. Um, you know, I've my triglycerides have, t- have trended way down over the last three years. I mean, I think my last lipid panel, my fasting triglycerides are like 42 or something. So my body is very efficient at using those as a fuel source. And so that's the idea. Even if you're a person that goes in and out of low carb or ketogenic, the idea is being metabolically flexible so that your body knows how to flip back and forth to burning glucose and burning fat, right? You want to be good at burning both of them. They're both going to be in your bloodstream, you know, all the time, a little bit at each time, but you don't want them hanging out for long periods of time. So, um, yeah, it's it's just funny to look at these test tubes and think that this is like a you know, super like well validated experiment. Yeah. But yeah. I'll I'll play crazy if people want to play crazy. <laughs> yeah, I I was sitting. Uh, Danny Vega and Robert Sykes were at my house. We were doing a hunting trip, and we watched that doc that documentary that you speak of uh, together. And they went nuts. They and <laughs> like they're like this. This doesn't make any sense. That they're scaring and they're freaking people out over these test tubes and. And uh, anyway, so there's... Well, I think the, I mean, I think the scary part is that people are already eating poorly. And so to, to scare them away from animal foods yeah. is going to push a lot of, of average people towards even more processed foods. Like when I did my vegan experiment, I went vegan for three days, a whole food vegan diet to show people what it did to my glucose. And I fell into the trap. Like I was in the grocery store and I'm like, well, Pop-Tarts are vegan. (laughs) I mean, it was like, do I really want to eat like this, you know, bowl of veggies or I could just have this. So, I mean, I, I totally get why people eat that way. I mean, when you eliminate really good satiating foods, like eggs and steak and things like that, I mean, like, what do you eat? Yeah. So that, that leads me to a, a topic that I like to discuss with people like you and eventually, I'm still working. I've mentioned this on the show before. I really want to do like a nutritional United Nations uh, podcast where I get people, well-respected and not confrontational people uh, from different methodologies. You know, I have friends that are vegan. I have friends in the Weight Watchers community. I have friends in the keto and carnivore space and just discuss like through line methods that seem to work for everybody. You know what I'm saying? Like, because... I lost 100 pounds eating five times a day. I had carbs in my, I was just, you know, I, I quit drinking beer and quit eating processed foods and I lost 100 pounds. I've been on the ketogenic diet for the last two years. I feel great. I feel optimized. So people are getting results all over the place. And I feel like it's more about the fundamental things that a lot of the, the different methodologies share. What do you feel like are some of those things? Like if you're making some basic, basic recommendations, people that are just trying to get healthy, like, you know, just looking at things like, like sleep and, and things like that. Like what are some of the yeah. basic fundamental yeah. things that are, go across the board, no matter what nutrition plan you're on? Yeah. You bring up a really good point. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the times when the ketogenic diet is being knocked around, it's saying, well, it's calories in calories out. You know, you can create a calorie deficit eating any diet. And I completely agree with that. Um, you know, you're a great example. I have patients that have lost significant amount of weight eating lots of different ways um, shoot, like you can lose weight on a celery juice cleanse. You can lose weight eating a Big Mac diet. I mean, people have proven this over and over and over, right? So when it comes to, when it comes to weight loss, yes, you have to create a calorie deficit. But when we're talking about optimal metabolic health, no matter how you eat, we know hands down. And one thing we all agree on is that excessive amounts of sugar and excessive amount of refined grain or seed oils in the diet are extremely inflammatory. So that's why when I did my experiment, I was eating like a whole food, you know, carnivore diet and a whole food plant diet, right? Because we know that things that have sugar, canola oil, gluten, these things are extremely inflammatory to the body. So across, you know, the world, I think that almost every, you know, doctor expert would agree on those things. But you bring up a really great point that I talk to patients about, and that's all the other pieces to the puzzle. So I don't care how well you eat, if you sleep poorly and you don't manage stress well, um, you can still have markers of inflammation in the body. You can still have diseases. So there's all these pieces to the puzzle and you can't just work on one. You have to work on all of them. So I talk to every single patient about this. We start with nutrition. 
and then we talk about sleep and then we talk about exercise because I always say you can't outrun a bad diet. Fats lost in the kitchen, muscles gained in the gym. (laughs) And for women, especially, um, you know, they go to the gym and they tend to, if I ask them what they do, they tend to get on a treadmill or get on the elliptical, right? They're not lifting weights. And if any woman is listening right now, if you want more bang for your buck, muscle is the organ of longevity. If you want more bang for your buck and, and more for your health, start doing some resistance training. If you want to keep your bicep when you're 60 years old and you're menopausal, you have to tell your bicep that you still need it. And that means that you have to put it under stress. And the other thing you have to do is eat adequate dietary protein. So, uh, so exercise is important, but resistance training is, is really the, the most important part of that. And then in stress reduction, and then kind of my last little like fairy dust sprinkle on top is living like an inspired life. Um, I see so many people that are still like, you know, they're doing things well, they're eating pretty healthy, but they just like, they don't, I don't want to say they're depressed, but like, you can just tell that they don't have this like underlying burning desire to like jump out of bed in the morning. And, right. and I think it comes down to like really human connection. I think the more that technology and social media and things have grown, people like don't interact with each other the same way. Yeah. Um, and I think our human relationships have become like extremely superficial. Um, sometimes I'll even ask patients like, do you have a best friend? Or like, how many really close friends do you have? And I'm starting to find that that's like few and far between. And people will come in and out of your life, um, you know, for, for like, they say, what do they say? Like a reason, a season or a lifetime. And I'm just starting to find that like people don't have those like lifetime friends anymore. And we really need to start to cultivate those human relationships again. And I mean, even when I say like, do you have a friend that can go to the gym with you? Like people are like, well, no, not really. Like that's yeah. really sad to me. Like it's really yeah. sad. And, um, and you know, we know what the divorce rates are and things like that with marriage. I mean, people just, they, they don't understand how to talk to each other anymore. So yeah. these are all the things that people need to work on to have optimal health all of them. Yeah. If, if my fitness pal is your only pal, then you're, 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 you're off track. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you led me to my next topic of discussion. I love to talk about, and that's female fitness. You know, I've got a four-year-old daughter. Uh, you talked about taking your daughters to frozen two. We're going to frozen two at the IMAX next weekend. Uh, I'm really, really excited about the environment that she's going to grow up into. Because when I was in elementary school, it was like, here are the girl push-ups, here are the boy push-ups, and here's the boy presidential fitness test, and here's the girl fit. You know, it was like, you know, and girls don't play certain sports and, and all this. And I feel like things are really changing. Girls don't lift weights because it'll make you look like a man. Uh, so that's the environment that I grew up in, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Um, how do you feel like we're doing right now compared to when you were growing up? Are, are you excited about the trends that you're seeing? Yeah, no, I really am. So I have three daughters for those of you that don't know that they're four, six, and eight. So I have these three little girls and they're totally watching what I'm doing. And I just think it's so cool to like do it with them. Like I, they come down to the workout room with me at home and like, they'll get down and try to do push ups and they'll, and we talk about our muscles and like how it makes us strong and how, when we're strong, we're able to do things with our bodies. And I just think that, you know, we need to raise our little girls to, to do things that the boys do. I mean, I totally agree with you. I was a college athlete. So, um, you know, I've been an athlete most of my life. I've never been afraid of like the gym or the field or the court or, you know, whatever you, whatever example you want to give. But, um, you know, women are working outside the home more than ever right now. Um, and I'm, I'm actually in a household where we've been talking about maybe my husband even staying at home, but, um, I think we need to set an example for young women of like what they can do. And there still are, you know, there's gender bias out there and, and it's definitely not my platform. Um, I've, I've never been one to feel like I need to play the victim role. Like I'm just like, go out and prove yourself, you know, but, um, I mean, it does exist. And the more that we can have strong women, um, not even just physically strong, but just like talking about confidence and things like that. Um, it's, it's really important for, for little girls to see that. So I think it was last week, at least uh, as, as far as I remember, I think it was last week on your Instagram um, somebody accused you of using steroids because you are an in shape female. Obviously that's, that's, that makes sense. Right. Uh, so 
I thought you handled that beautifully. I could tell it pissed you off. <laughs> like I could tell. I'm like, I know that this this got the doc uh, fired up, but I, I felt like you handled it really well. But like, how did that make you feel when when somebody was like, you know, being a hater like that? Well, I mean, that's <laughs> that's kind of like the notch of success, right? You're not like you're not important unless you have haters. But <laughs> um, you know, it comes with the territory. But um, you know. I, I have great body image, you know, I really do. And, and I, I really wasn't offended. I think actually it was a nice compliment because I know, and people that know me know, I don't do steroids. <laughs> um, but it also kind of like leads back to this thing about like women and body image and just like sexualizing women's bodies, like that it's manly if a woman has muscles and yeah. it's like, you know, like, I don't know. It's just sad. It's just sad is really what it is because, and and I'll be the first to admit, I mean, most of the people that accused me were men, like there wasn't any other <laughs> women doing it. Yeah. Um, which I mean, I think it comes out of a place of fear. You know, when people troll people and hate people, it comes out of a, a place of their own fear and intimidation yeah. and things like that. And so Insecurity. I really try to, you know, I try to view those situations, you know, with empathy and, um, it really, I didn't really get fired up until somebody attacked my kids, which they're like, <laughs> then the mama bear will really come out. But yeah. um, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. I think that, you know, having a strong, a strong, healthy body um, should be the norm. I just, I mean, I also, you know, there's been a lot of like women empowerment projects. A lot of companies have used, you know, um, for instance, Victoria's Secret is not having their annual women's fashion show this year. They're rebranding, their business has been hurt. And I think it has to do a lot with that, you know, um, female image and empowerment. And, um, but at the same time, I also, you know, we're starting to put bigger women into ads and things like that. And, and I want it to be more of a place of like health, right? Like you don't have to look muscular, but you know, obesity also is not healthy. So, um, it's just really about, you know, being in a healthy state, whatever that looks like for each woman. So along those lines, a topic that I've uh, addressed a few times on the show, and as a coach, I'm always interested in getting other experts' opinions on this. Like, I get the importance of respecting yourself and self-love and being happy with what you're doing and where you're at. But I feel like it's also important not to accept poor health. You know what I'm saying? And walking that fine line of, you know, I feel like there's a group of people out there, they're like, I'm happy with who I am. I, I weigh 300 pounds, but I, I'm just like, I'm thinking about their kids and the people that need them to be around. So how do you navigate that situation of respecting yourself, the self-love, but also respecting yourself enough to optimize your health so that you just live a healthy life? How, how do you walk that line when you have somebody that comes in to your clinic or approaches you online and asks you for advice? Yeah, I mean, I tell people that basically self-care is self-respect. So like you would never schedule an office meeting with like the CEO of your company and then not show up to it. Right. So why do we perpetually schedule things for ourselves and then not show up to them? We do that on a daily basis. Right. And I call it the blame, shame and justify game. <laughs> um, no, like no matter what it is, it's either like someone else's fault, um, or like some level of shame to yourself. Like there's when, when you talk about like self-confidence and things like that, shame is basically, I don't deserve it. So it's like, it's something we use, like it's just another justification method. But um, when I work with clients and patients, I really try to get down to the root cause because there's usually some like underlying, like self-belief that's inhibiting them. And whether it's like something from their childhood or a poor relationship they're in, or just a belief that like they don't deserve it, um, it, it's more like most of them can tell you what to do. Like they can tell you how they need to eat and how they need to move. Like it's not that they don't know what to do. Yeah, they're confused by a lot of things, but um, it's usually it's, it's self limiting beliefs is what it is that they you know. And it's I get it. I've been in that place in my life um, where I was like a busy mom of three kids, and I just said, "Well, I'm a doctor, and my husband works nights, and I've got three kids," and I played that game with myself for years for years. And people always say, well, I don't, I don't understand how you get up at 5am and like work out every day. And I have this motto and people, my followers know it. I say, pay yourself first. 
Yeah. You know, why are you giving away your time and energy to everyone else? Because if I don't take care of myself, I can't be a good mom, can't be a good wife, I can't be a good doctor, I can't be up at 2 a.m., you know, doing deliveries. So like, I need to take care of my mental and physical being so that I can be that for everyone else. And so that's what I really try to instill in people is like, they'll say, well, I have this successful real estate business and like, I'm a great mom to my kids. And you're exactly right. Okay. But what happens when you get diabetes or cancer or whatever it is, and now you can't do that anymore. Yeah. Health is the one thing that you cannot buy. You cannot buy it. And so, um, the sooner that people realize that, um, I think their, their mindset really starts to change. Yeah. I see so many moms, especially that they are just amazing moms, but they put everybody else first, the kids first, the career first, their spouse first, and their last. And all that time to invest in themselves gets squeezed out of the day and it ends up being Netflix and chill at the, the end of the day, just like for a few minutes, just to keep things together. And, you know, like I said, you, know, you are very out there with your schedule, with how you operate on your Instagram stories. They're amazing. If you guys aren't following Dr. Fit and Fabulous on, on Instagram, you need to. Um, but can you go through just like a typical daily routine of how you keep it all together? Because you seem very organized and uh, you have a certain regimen that seems to work for you. <laughs> I love that you use the word organized because I would. I wish you could like see my office right now. But <laughs> <laughs> Your schedule like an, seems organized. Yeah. It's like an, I would like to call it organized chaos is what I like to call it. Um, because <clears throat> I live a life that's totally in flux, right? I never know when people will go into labor. I never know when I'll need to be at the hospital. I have a husband who's a police officer that works at night. So literally there are situations where I'm just like calling three or four numbers down on the call list to see who can come help out with help out with my kids. But a typical day, a typical day, if I was in control of everything, I wake up at 4.30 a.m. I'm at the gym by 5 a.m. Um, I work out typically for about 60 minutes and I do three days a week of resistance training and three days a week of like HIIT training. Um, it's kind of varied over the last couple months, but basically six days of workouts, one day is a rest day. And then at um, six, I usually go jump in the sauna. It just depends if I have, sometimes I have 7am surgery and sometimes I don't. So if it's a morning where I don't have surgery, then I get to like take my time at the gym. <laughs> sometimes I'll do a little extra, but I always try to do sauna like at least three days a week. And then I usually come home and I let the dog out and make my kids breakfast. They're always up really early. My kids are like early risers. So they're always like sitting in the living room waiting for me when I get home from the gym. And I um, help them get dressed. I make them breakfast. I jump in the shower and get ready. And then I, if I don't have surgery, I, I actually drop my two oldest off at school at eight o'clock. And then I'm straight over to the office to see patients. And I'm in my clinic four days a week. And I'm usually out of the clinic by, um, by 4.30 or 5 p.m. And um, some days, you know, I get called back to the hospital for deliveries or surgeries. Um, but then it's, you know, family time and time with my kids. Sometimes I do have online consults in the evening or I'm doing work on, on fit and fabulous stuff. Um, and then the next day I just like wake up and repeat. And, um, it's it, for me, the reason that my workouts are at 5.00 AM is because that's the one time of the day where I'm least likely to get disrupted. Yeah. <laughs> so as long as that's done, I mean, I have tried to work out in the evenings and afternoons and I just seem like way less motivated. Like when I get home in the evenings, the last thing I want to do is go work out. I promise you. Um, and so I, and I also think from a circadian rhythm standpoint, it's not good to like ramp your system up like that. Yeah. So late in the day, um, like for people that have watched my continuous glucose monitoring, I mean, with my HIIT workouts, like I can get my glucose up to like 140, 150, and that's all like, you know, adrenaline, epinephrine, gluconeogenesis at its best. Right. And so, um, I just think that morning workouts, if you can fit them into your schedule are most ideal from a circadian rhythm standpoint, but, um, that's pretty much a, a day in my life. I mean, it's a lot of the same things over and over and over. And, uh, it's, uh, it's what's worked for me. So what time do you have a routine? Like I'm trying to in, be in bed asleep by a certain time. If you're getting up to work out at five, uh, to get your workout in that early. Yeah. A lot of people ask how much sleep I get. So I try to track my sleep with an aura ring and I typically get between, um, usually between six and a half and seven and a half hours of sleep. It just depends. I, yeah. I try to say, I tell patients be in bed asleep, head on the pillow, dead asleep by 10 30. I try to be in bed by 10. And honestly, because I wake up so early, sometimes I'll even go to bed earlier. Um, I just kind of listen to my body. Like when I get tired, 
Um, if I'm doing a lot of computer work in the evenings, I try to wear my blue light blockers to really increase that melatonin secretion. It's just such a useful tool. I wish more people knew about it, but yeah. Basically, you know, when we used to live outside, we lived by like the sun and the moon. And now we live in houses and cars and businesses. And we have totally lost that um, connection with the sun. And the sun actually sets our cortisol and melatonin production. So in the evenings, I typically try to wear those. And then if I do red light therapy, I have my own red light therapy unit at home. Yeah. I, try, I do that right before bed usually. Nice. What And what uh, brand do you like on the red light? Well, I actually own two different units. I have a Juve unit and I have a red light rising unit and um, they both have little nuances, but they're basically like the same power. But I bought it just, I really mostly for like anti-aging benefits of my face. All right. I'm like, I want to look 20 for the rest of my life. But um, then I started looking at the research on like thyroid benefits yeah. and like testosterone benefits for men. So I did a little N of one experiment with my husband and I made him put his, uh, put a scrotum in front of it for 30 days and we checked his testosterone. I'm sure he'll love that I'm telling everyone this. Yes. Um, but he raised his testosterone like 250 points. I, we, I saw the Ben Greenfield like, you know, thing that he did. And I was like, you got to try this out. So, oh my God. Yeah, so now how he's long... redlining on, on the regular. <laughs> All right. I'm asking for a friend. How long, how long did he do it for? Like 30, you said 28 days, but how long exposure to the scrotum? Like, Oh, in- I think 20 minutes usually. That's... Yeah. It's pretty serious. May not, I don't even know if he does 20. He might only do like 12 or 15. Oh. We ha- we live opposite schedules, so we don't red light together. <laughs> Just probably a good thing because normally he's really ramped up after the red light. Yeah, make sure you <laughs> clean it off before, before you switch. Uh, so you obviously work with a lot of moms, and I told you that we have a, a very uh, female-dense uh, population that listens to this, this podcast. If you could just like wave... A magic wand and eliminate uh, some negative self-talk or a roadblock or an obstacle or a mindset that you see a lot of women, moms especially having right now, what would that be and how would we look to correct that? Well, I, the, the one thing that I hear from a lot of moms is when it comes to self-care, they feel guilty for doing things for themselves because they feel in a way that that's taking away something from their children. And so I really try to flip the script in these situations and remind them that they're running themselves into the ground. Like, how do you expect to be a good mom when you are tired and fatigued and you have headaches and your periods are horrible and you're telling me that you're depressed and you have no sex drive, which is affecting your relationship with your husband? I mean, there's just so many things. And when you start to like pull those things out, and remind them that idea of that, like self-care is self-respect. Um, I think they start to buy into it more, but it's really, I totally get it. I'm a mom of three girls. And, and so what I try to do is I say, okay, you love your kids so much. You don't want to take any right time from your kids. Why don't you do it together? Because you can do workouts at home. You can get down on the floor with your kids and look at the example that you're setting for your children. Like I said, I take my girls down to the gym with me. And I say, hey, let's, you know, they can jump rope, they can do all those things. And when we sit at the dinner table, we talk about how the food affects us. And a lot of people ask about my kids' diets, and I'll be the first to admit, we were ketogenic two years, we were making salmon and broccoli for dinner, and I was making my kids mac and cheese. Like, I was just like a mom who just wants everyone to finish their dinner and not complain and (laughs) and be done with it, right? And... I'm like, okay, this is crazy. So this last a year, a little over a year ago, we started to kind of attack our kids' diets and we cleaned up the snack bin and they started to eat what we ate. And we just started to have conversations at the dinner table of like the food we're putting. We don't say like, you can have this and you can't have this. And my kids are like way more carb sensitive than I am. But we just talk about like, what does the food do inside of our bodies? We bought this amazing book, by the way, if um, you're looking for a children's book, Buddies in My Belly. It's this little children's book. Nice. wrote by Sarah Morgan, one of my great friends and colleagues. And it talks about the microbiome and like what the food does inside of our belly. <laughs> That's awesome. And they even have these little stuffed animals that go with it. with like Biffy, the bifidobacterium. And my kids <laughs> totally love it. They love it. But um, it's cool to like sit at the dinner table and my daughter will be like, how much sugar's in this? Or like, you should eat that. It's good for your buddies in your belly. And you know, you can involve your kids in your healthy way of living. Like, don't think that just because you have decided to do this, that it's somehow taking away something from them. No, no, no. It's adding to their life too. Because as you become a better mom, 
to them, you're going to raise them in a, in a better way too. Uh, I'm in a similar position with, I, I've got an eight year old son and four year old daughter. And uh, just I, for me, for us, it's been a lot about the way we word things. So my kids take fish oil every single morning. I don't call it fish oil. I call it vitamins. And that's key because if I call it fish oil, there's no way in hell they're going to, they're going to drink it. Um, I make a, a dry whey protein powder, uh, like a chocolate, and I mix it with almond butter, and I call it frosting. And I put frosting on things where they just eat it just to get some protein in their system. So a lot of it with parents, like if you go about it, and then it's not lying to your children, but we're just, right. you know, it's creative naming for, the, for their own good, right? Yeah, yeah. No, we, my daughter has seen me eat liver and salmon roe. <laughs> And they have tried a lot of things, but that's like the, the two things. And I was straight up. I was like, yeah, this is fish eggs. And she's like, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eventually, especially the older they get, they figure it out anyway. So you got to start them early. Like, yeah, you used to eat this all the time. Oh, did I? Okay. Um, so another avenue I wanted to explore with you is just kind of the state of medical professionals in general, we're seeing more medical professional, professionals come in, throw their hat in the ring, and they're doing their own learning about things like ketogenic diet. And we're getting away from food pyramid recommendations and all that nonsense. So uh, if there are, I know that, you know, medical professionals listen to this podcast, and there's somebody out there wanting to just gain knowledge, because the base knowledge as you come up the ranks in school, it's just not there. Like they're not teaching carnivore and, and ketogenic diets and things like that. And most uh, college uh, curriculum. So where, where do you feel like it is a good place for a medical professional to start their learning journey? Uh, obviously, following what you're, you're, what you're doing is a great example. But uh, other than that, like, where did you go for the info as you were learning about this? And then you can take that and impact your, your patients. Yeah, so I, I have a degree in nutrition before I went to medical school, which was much different than a lot of my colleagues. Um, you know, a lot of them came from like biochemistry backgrounds or, you know, other things like that. And so, you know, I'm not blaming other doctors. I mean, I do think the vast majority of doctors really do want their patients to be healthy, yeah. but unfortunately they don't have the education or the tools to help them. And so number one, be able to admit that you can't help them um, or that you don't know enough about something and be open-minded because we know that things in medicine change. I mean, look at the things we even did five, 10, you know, 15 years ago that have, you know, not panned out like we thought. Um, there's lots more functional medicine, lifestyle medicine type doctors these days. So encourage your patients if you can't help them to find, you know, somebody that can when it comes to it. Um, as far as, you know, uh, there are great conferences like Metabolic Health Summit that's happening in January. There's lots of great conferences that are still like very science-based. They offer CMEs. You can come learn about different applications. I think the cool thing about the ketogenic space is that although a lot of people think about the keto diet, you know, in regards to weight loss, but I mean, we're seeing the ketogenic diet as an adjunct to cancer treatment, um, as an adjunct to other, you know, metabolic diseases. Verta Health has shown like a significantly amazing, amazing, like reversal rate of type two diabetes. So, I mean, the medical literature is there. You cannot turn a blind eye to it. It's just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. So, um, I am now a board certified ketogenic nutrition specialist. So the American Nutrition Association now has a board certification program. If you're interested in getting certified, um, you can do it. It's all online. You don't have to go anywhere. You just write your check and take the classes and, the, and yeah. take the board exam. But I mean, just get educated. We're, we're all, um, you know, we're all lifelong learners here. Um, sometimes, sometimes you just have to admit that, that we don't all know everything. So yeah, and KetoCon is another great resource. I brought one of my uh, my friends and uh, clients out to KetoCon. She's a medical professional, and she was just so impressed and just totally on board with what was being said. So um, that's that's good. KetoCon 2020. Let's let's get there, people. Yeah, I'll be there. I'm speaking. Yes, me too. It's gonna be amazing. Um, all right, now I've had some female clients that have shied away from low carb keto carnivore just because their menstrual cycle gets disrupted initially, and they kind of freak out and, and push away. So any tips around how females should ease into that low carb lifestyle, or if there is a menstrual cycle disruption, what that means and how we can get back on course with that? Yeah, yeah, great question. So 
first of all, the menstrual cycle is like the fifth vital sign in women. So if you're not having a regular menstrual cycle, which for most people is somewhere between like 26 and 32 days long apart, um, if you're not having a normal menstrual cycle, your body is telling you that this is not a good time to have a baby. And that's why it stopped your cycle. So it's typically due to poor ovulation or absence of ovulation. That's what triggers your menstrual cycle. And so your body is, is sending you a message. Now, when you're first starting something, if you drastically reduce your calories or drastically alter your nutrition, it's quite possible that you could throw off your menstrual cycle. So it's a very delicate balance of, of estrogen and progesterone and, and other hormones that are secreted from the brain. Um, now your thyroid also plays a role. So women, we need to acknowledge that women are like really complex biological creatures. <laughs> yeah. But if you are starting out on uh, on a new lifestyle, especially if you are losing weight, it's possible that you could have some menstrual dysregulation. But usually within a couple of months, things will balance out. If you're like two, three months into it and it's and, and it's still not happening, then you should work with a provider and get some testing to take a look at what's going on. But for people to just say like, oh, I don't want to try low-carb or ketogenic, especially if you're somebody that has insulin resistance or obesity, I mean, or PCOS, like these are the primary therapies. So work, work with a provider, you know, that can help you in those situations. But um, I have seen, you know, flipping over like to the carnivore side, I have seen some women in the carnivore space that have lost their menstrual cycles. I, you know, I work with clients one-on-one -on -one and things like that. And I don't know if women's bodies were really designed to be like strict, strict carnivores. A lot of times in these situations, I, I have them add back in some tuberous vegetables or berries, like if their gut can tolerate it. And a lot of times that will bring the menstrual cycle back. Sometimes it can be just that they're at a very low body fat percentage, but it, it requires testing to look and see. But I think that people need to be really cautious, especially with women and of reproductive age of being like really dogmatic about one approach, because I, I do think there's some women that need less carbs or maybe some that need a little bit more. And then when it comes to pregnancy, you know, that's like a, a whole nother animal <laughs> of its yeah. own, you know, like how should you eat in each trimester is a little bit different when we look at the physiology and I'm, uh, I'm writing a whole book about it. So stay nice. tuned. But um, but I think that, um, that women should listen to their bodies and listen to their menstrual cycle, but it doesn't mean that it's not the right lifestyle for you. It just means that your body is going through lots of changes and it's trying to find its new normal basically. So the body is always trying to adjust. It's called homeostasis. It always wants to be in like this, like balance. And, um, sometimes going through those changes, you, you do have to go through some of the, some of the side effects of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's an adjustment period there and you gotta, like you said, listen to your body, but also don't freak out too early because you're kind of dipping your toe outside of the comfort zone. And we have to kind of see what that, what that looks like for like, like, like for instance, like just an example is like, if somebody goes on a diet and they lose like 20 pounds the first month, if I check their labs, they may have a reduction in thyroid function. Like we know even just in calorie deficit that women will have a reduction in thyroid function. And I can look at those labs and tell that person, oh my gosh, don't do this. Go back to doing whatever you're doing before. You're damaging your thyroid. <laughs> but usually, like if we wait six to eight weeks and we just continue to watch, you should always like watch and trend labs. Like you shouldn't have a knee-jerk reaction off one set of lab values. Um, you should watch them and trend them. Um, a lot of times things will, will normalize. And for instance, like with thyroid, we know of all the studies that have been done in the in people who are ketogenic, remember, we can't take regular nutrition studies and apply them to people that are ketogenic. But we do, across the board, see a reduction in T3 levels, which is your active thyroid hormone, but we don't see a rise in TSH. So what it's, what it's believed, you know, Dr. Finney and Dr. Volek have like done a lot of studies in this space, is that it's just like we see an increase in insulin sensitivity, we see an increase in thyroid sensitivity. So Interesting. Super interesting. Yeah, it's cool stuff. All right, Doc, I know that you are getting ready to see patients here in T minus like 10 minutes. So I got to get you out. But let's make sure that people can connect with you and dive into your universe. I'm telling you, listeners, get on Instagram, follow Dr. Fit and Fabulous. I will put all the connection links inside the show notes. But is that the best place to start? Or do you direct people somewhere else to connect? Yeah, no, they can find me on Instagram or Facebook, Dr. Fit and Fabulous. And then my website is drfitandfabulous.com. 
and stay tuned. I'm speaking at a lot of conferences. Keto Summit Omaha is happening January 10th and 11th. Adam's going to be there. Yep. Come meet us. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I'll be at KetoCon next uh, summer. I'll be speaking at Metabolic Health Summit January, February. Some lots of uh, lots of cool stuff and projects going on and some I can't even tell you about. So. We'll talk about your, your summit first because I, we need to get this out there because I, I want people yeah. going because any yeah. chance I get to go and learn with my community. I love it. So who is going to be there? Why should we be there? Yeah, so January 10th and 11th, Omaha, Nebraska. You can get your tickets at ketosummitomaha.com. Uh, it's not sold out yet, so you can still go get your tickets. But we have um, Dr. Sean Baker is coming, um, Dr. Adam Nally, Dr. Ken Berry, uh, Dr. Annette Bosworth, Mike Mutzel, Danny Vega, Robert Sykes, Nurse Cindy. Um, we have a reproductive endocrinologist um, here in town, Dr. Stephanie Gustin, that's going to be speaking. Um, I know I'm missing somebody. Who am I missing? Um, we just have an amazing, amazing lineup of speakers. Um, it is powered by Redmond Life. So who doesn't love real salt and um, and a keto brick too? So yes. it's going to be amazing. It's it's a one and a half, two day conference. You can come connect with the keto community. I think that's honestly like the best part about it is just getting in a room with a bunch of like-minded people. And it is fun to learn. And you're going to hear some inspiring stories. We have a couple panels, a fitness panel. You can learn how to build muscle on a ketogenic diet. We'll have a doctor's panel. And then we have a transformation panel of just regular people who have had extreme success, um, with the ketogenic lifestyle and you can, and you can just come learn more about it. It's for, it's for everybody. Amazing. And I'm, I'm running an Airbnb with Robert and Danny and we legit have a heart shaped hot tub and I'm not lying about that. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. And it, so it's probably gonna be like two degrees in Omaha, Nebraska in January. And we're going to be out that in that, in our speedos and the hot, heart shaped hot tub. It's going to be I love it. amazing. Love it, it will be fit and fabulous in that hot tub. Uh, so Dr. Jamie Seaman, I appreciate you so much. This has been uh, everything I'd hoped for. I knew that you were going to deliver a lot of great inspiration uh, to our audience here. And I know you're, you're very busy. I'm glad that we worked out our schedules so you could contribute some of your unique knowledge to the Million Pound Mission. So I appreciate you very much, my friend. And congratulations on your 300th episode. That's awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. It's time to set those implementation alarms. If you found something that Dr. Jamie said that you want to implement into your regimen or learn more about, set the alarm for 24 hours from right now and take action so you can get out there and own it every meal, every workout, every day. I will see you on the next episode. Well, hey there, good looking. I want to say thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Million Pound Mission podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you. If this episode made an impact for you, would you share it out with one person? Help me spread the message of the Million Pound Mission and add some fuel to the fire of our goal to achieve a million pounds of amazing results. And speaking about that million pounds, if you haven't gone to millionpoundmission.com lately and donated your weight loss, please do it or I'll never reach my goal. So head on over to millionpoundmission.com, donate that weight and spread the word that we are on a million pound mission together. <laughs>